All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Christina Woods, who is just up the road in Huntington Beach, California. How are you doing, Christina? I'm great. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and Christina uh, now is um, uses the power of RTT hypnotherapy and coaching to give the client your clients the uh, the opportunity to deeply connect and get to the root of what's holding them back. But you also had a thirty year career in sales and leadership, and as you say yourself, it would have been a lot less stressful had you <laughs> known more about mindset and how to dialogue with the mind. So here, let me let me start off on this right is I don't think very many people die or enough people dialogue with their mind, because I think we're living in a society today where the pervasive culture is don't. It, everything is distraction. You've got your phones, you've got everything. You don't. They try to stop you spending a second with yourself. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people don't because uh, and never get the chance to have that self dialogue because they never have a quiet moment. You're so right. Stillness is this thing that you're not supposed to have because then you're unproductive, right? So um, I think I think it first starts this dialogue that people don't understand is that we live in this false belief that we are controlled by our conscious mind, that we can logically um, you know, figure things out. And when it comes between emotions and logic, emotions are always going to trump um, mm -hmm. because we're ruled by our subconscious mind. 95% of what's calling the shots is in our subconscious mind. It's how we think about the world, ourselves, our family members, um, our performance at work. It's not at a conscious level. So, you know, we think we're real quick and sharp and can figure everything out. I'm very rational. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to look it up on my phone. And it's buried in our subconscious. So that's that's the kind of stuff I wish I would have known about in those 30 years of sales and leadership. And and I think the other thing, too, is um, I call them like triggers and stuff is that we have so many things that, we you know, go back sometimes like to our childhood or whatever that that can trigger us and we never we never identify or or realize those things i mean and you can say well that's ridiculous like 40 years later mm -hmm. i'm sitting in a meeting and somebody says something innocuous relatively innocuous but it triggers because it triggers a reaction in me and and i think the other part too is the fact that uh you can identify these things because they're physiological as well as mental right oh absolutely so every every thought we think creates a physical reaction in our body i mean if you do the old close your eyes and pretend you're eating a lemon you know your mouth's going to start salivating and there's no lemon so you can only imagine if our feelings were hurt when we're young when you're five years old you can only process it as a five-year-old um, fast forward to to me and you know in my 50s now we don't process it as a 50 year old we we still have that belief that program that trigger as a five year old so you're absolutely right these triggers they might seem silly now or why do I still get mad at my my parents and act like I'm 18 or 15 as an adult because these beliefs are programs and we get programmed by our environment, by our church, by our work, by our, our family, our culture. Um, it's impossible to not have these programs happen. And it's, it's not necessarily trauma. It's just the meaning that we attach to things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can get picked up from your soccer game when you're eight years old late. And the meaning you attach is that, you know, mom and dad liked your brother more than you. Um, and really, they just got stuck at the light because there was an accident. And it's just the meaning that we attach um, or something traumatic can happen to someone and they take a, um, you know, something enlightening out of it, whereas someone else takes, you know, that that now I'm not worthy out of it. So, yeah, what happens is our thoughts create a blueprint. So just like when you look at the blueprint of a home or a building, it creates a blueprint and then that blueprint is mirrored back to us. And so mm -hmm. if we really want to find out what those triggers are and often those triggers are just the blueprint is just a lie and 
what are those lies that are coming back? And they might've made sense at the time because our mind is always actually just trying to keep us safe and protect us, but they often don't make a lot of sense as we, we move through life later on. So what's that blueprint? Because every thought you think, it has a physical reaction, but it's it's literally creating a blueprint. And it, it becomes our responsibility at some point to dig in and find out, all right, what's this blueprint that I'm working off of? Mm -hmm. um, because my, blue, my, my blueprint is dictating the events in my life, the relationships, my performance, what I'm doing in life. Yeah. So how do you, uh, so how does one start this process? Cause like I said, I think it's one that's running counter culture almost. Uh, and, and, and as you said, you know, people stillness is like, well, well you're, I'm doing nothing. I'm daydreaming or whatever. That's not good. Or, right. you know, I'm, I, I, there's something on my phone I should be checking right now or whatever, but how do you start the process of actually getting yourself to, to engage with yourself for want of a better yeah. Yeah. Uh, phrase? Sure. So think of think of your mind as it will do exactly what it thinks you want it to do. So one easy thing that we can do is pay attention to the words we use and the pictures that we put in our mind. So it it pays attention and it does exactly what you want it to do. So um, I'm your mind and I start paying attention to the words you use. So if we're in traffic, you and I know the the five freeway very well. So, you know, we're saying, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this traffic is killing me. Um, or my boss is driving me nuts. And so our mind will do exactly what it thinks it wants us to do. So boom, there we go. We get migraines. Boom. Oh, you don't want to go to work. Oh, you don't want to be on the freeway. Oh, so pay attention to the words because words are incredibly powerful. They're cheap. You don't have to do anything to go start changing the language. And if you know, you can choose the words you use, you can choose the pictures and images you put in your mind. You cannot choose what they do to your physical body and how they manifest in your life. You don't get a choice. Your mind literally does exactly what you, what it thinks that you want it to do. So, you know, things like, um, you know, I, I should be doing this or I try, or I'm, you know, I'm trying, you know, we all know trying is very trying. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, when it comes to something in life that even we're nervous about saying, um, I'm going to do fantastic. People love listening to me. I'm, you know, I'm going to get on stage and I'm going to speak something. Everyone gets nervous about public speaking. People are going to love what I say. Words flow out of my mouth, you know, just so easily and effortlessly. Then you get up there and your mind does exactly what it thinks you want it to do. So it's very, very powerful. So that's that's one one thing. Yeah, and and it's and that's uh and that's relatively you know straightforward. I didn't say it was easy. Um, you know, simple simple doesn't ever doesn't always equate to easy. So from from what you're saying is that we have to pay very very close attention to the words and the language you use and what we're what we're in. Um, putting out to the world as well as putting in internally, because that is kind of, as you said, that's laying out the blueprint, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's this epidemic in the world that most of us somewhere buried in that blueprint is that we're not enough. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not rich enough. We're not fit enough. We're not a good enough parent. We're not wealthy enough. We're not whatever enough. And so oftentimes that's the blueprint. And so then that becomes the words that we use. Right. And that's the dialogue that we start to have. We start to think, all right, well, if I work a little harder, then my boss will appreciate me more. I'll do this or I have to do something to become enough. And that's what our mind hears. And so we become this sort of mirror of, well, I'm always having to do, I'm always having to become something to be enough. Well, we're all born enough. You don't have any baby walking around thinking the food on their face, the dirty diaper, that they're not enough. They're like smiling and they're happy and mm -hmm. I'm good enough. Like it doesn't matter what I look like or smell like they know they're enough and we all are born enough. So um, that's, it's the words are so powerful and your mind listens to them. And the other thing is that what you expect, you realize. So what you're, what you expect, if you expect success, if you expect, oh my gosh, I'm 10 minutes late. I've just ruined my whole entire day. Now I'm just completely, you know, behind on everything and nothing's going to catch up with me. And now I've just like ruined the whole day. I'll have to start over tomorrow. Yeah. That's, that's what you expect. That's what you're going to get. You get to be right. Definitely. Um, but you know what? 
it's okay. I didn't need to be on time. I only have 10 minutes now to prepare for that conference call or 10 minutes to prepare for whatever it might be. That's all I need. My mind is like Google. It gets me all the answers I need. I'm exact, you know, exactly where I need to be. I needed that extra 10 minutes of sleep. Um, that's exactly what I needed. And you start to calm your nervous system down. Yeah, that's that's fascinating because I mean all the things that you outlined there would normally get people into a frenetic, um, a frenetic state of mind. The other thing too is uh, what you were saying there about you know not being enough. So a lot of times we're on this we're in this constant or on this constant journey to get to where we will be enough. But it's always in it's always somewhere in the future and it's always mm -hmm. somewhat slightly out of reach. And I think it's. I think it was James Joyce or somebody who wrote it like, uh, if you live in the future, like you're living at an arm's length from yourself, right? Yeah. You're not living in the present, you're living at an arm's length. You know, one of the things when I work with clients, I try to, to instill in them is that, you know, we have to learn, we're a society that forgets we fill our own cups and we're constantly mm -hmm. handing our cups over to other people to fill. So our kids, our boss, our work, or whatever, somebody else. And I promise you, when you hand somebody else your cup to make you feel good enough, they don't want it, for one. They don't know what to do with it. And it's exhausting. And, and it's so, it's, it, it brings so much peace. And you are actually so much uh, more able to find stillness when you know you fill up your own cup. And when you can fill up your own cup and you know you're enough, so much more just kind of flows and rolls in your life because you're not out there always trying to search for something to fill your cup up with where it's already full. You're already enough. Yeah. And, and the point about, you know, outsourcing your cup to, to other people. Yeah. You know, number one, as you said, they don't want it. It's, it's exhausting. And maybe you're giving it to somebody who goes, yeah, well, I'm just going to smash your cup because that makes me feel good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, um, you know, our, our, our mind does this little thing. Our mind always is going to move towards what's familiar and away from what's unfamiliar. So, you know, people pleasers is pretty common. Um, I work with a lot of women and, you know, I think somewhere along the line, a lot of women sign up for, to be people pleasers because again, they're having their cup filled up, but you know, I think everybody at some point does it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you're right, people can smash it. Um, and then what happens is our mind goes to what's familiar. So we start to actually believe like, wow, I got to keep doing more and more. They smash my cup or they don't fill it or they don't want to fill it. I must not really be good enough. I must need to do more and more. And our mind actually goes towards what's familiar. So if the belief is I'm not enough, then it actually goes towards more and more. So if you really want to make profound changes in your life, you actually have to make the familiar, unfamiliar, and the unfamiliar familiar. So telling yourself, I am enough. I'm whatever it is you want to make the opposite of. I'm, you know, if I'm working with a smoker, I'm a non-smoker. Mm -hmm. My body loves being a non-smoker. I, you know, I, I thrive in breathing, you know, fresh air and, and finding things to do with my hands, whatever, making an, the unfamiliar familiar and the familiar unfamiliar. And you can find any area in your life. It probably will take us all two seconds to find something <laughs> that we want to make um, unfamiliar and familiar, but it wants to keep you safe. So even if a negative thought, it doesn't care if it's right or wrong, good or bad. If, if it wants to keep you safe, even if it's a negative thought. So we got to kind of trick it, just keep doing it over and over and over until what you want is familiar. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. And, and, uh, and on, on top of that uh, as well is, I guess you have to be more conscious of who you surround yourself with, because I always find that this is another part is, is that, we often have these people in our lives who, you know, you may say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to start my RTT practice, right? And they go, really? Why would you want to do that? And, and, and we allow these people to, to second guess everything we do and oh. rather, and, and we have to, we have to identify them. We also have to recognize that it's our fault that they're there. They're serving a purpose for us. It's not their fault. They're just doing what they're doing. They're serving a purpose for us. And we've got to figure out why do we feel that need? 
Oh, absolutely. You're at, oh, when I switched my 30 year corporate career to be a hypnotherapist, you can only imagine, right? What I heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you must have lost your marbles. What? Yeah. Um, and um, absolutely. So what 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 are they serving? Are they what what are they feeding? Um, and are they feeding that I am enough mantra that that you're that you're fueling? Um, one of the things that I when I'm working with clients that I tell them is watch the relationships around you change because you will, you won't need certain relationships anymore. And, and not that they'll go away. Bye-bye, but mm -hmm. the dynamic will change. And one of the best practices is just to, to remind and even say out loud, if you need to is, you know what, you can feel that way. And I understand that's your opinion, but I don't let that in. I just, I don't let that in. I, I feel this way. I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited about this and I don't let that in. I'm, you know, I've, I've got this bubble around me and I'm excited and, you know, um, we see different. I don't let that in. And they don't know what to do when you say, I don't let that in. Um, they sort of kind of hush and, and go their way, but dynamics and relationships change when, when we change because the, the energy we need is different. Um, and energy dynamics are constantly changing as, as our energy changes. And I, I think, um, you know, just allowing ourselves the opportunity and the permission to change relationships and what we need. It's very scary to change relationships and to know that that no longer serves us um, because actually we have grown and evolved and, you know, people, People um, often take a long time to forgive ourselves when we make mistakes, but mistakes are human. We learn, we grow, and we evolve. And sometimes we punish ourselves longer than criminals' uh, sentences in prison. Um, you know, let's let's move on and grow and evolve, and and um, you know, and, and move yeah. forward. <laughs> no, and I, and I think that I think that's a really powerful point, actually, because. Um, I even had it re quite recently with somebody um, uh, close who was starting to talk about, oh, the regrets and the things that they'd done and they wish they were. And I said, you know, there's no point. I said, it's all gone. It's in the past. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully you learn something from it and now you can adapt it differently. But, but to your point is, you're right, is we give ourselves sometimes life sentences, right. dumb, dumb mistakes, or we acted in, we did something wrong or we didn't do treat this person right or that, but we cling on to that for a lifetime. Right. Life without parole. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I think it's a good practice to look at where were you in your life at that point and where are you now and have compassion for where you were then and, and fascination and compassion for how far you've come. We often, you know, you, you, you talked about, you know, being triggered and, and often, those programs and blueprints we have do come from our childhood and, you know, this inner child thing we sort of laugh at, but it's real. Um, and we all have an inner child. And so sometimes having compassion for that five-year-old or 10-year-old in us that was hurt, that did certain things in our lives that maybe we're not proud of, but we have compassion and we understand why they felt hurt or why they did that. Just compassion alone allows us to learn and grow and you know what, I've learned and grown and I'm, I've improved. And those are things I don't say or do anymore. And um, I'm so much more compassionate when I see it now in other people. Um, that's that's an incredible thing, a gift to give the world and other people instead of judging people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think the point is, I mean, think of it, you know, if you think of things you did years ago, whatever. I mean, there's and you're beating yourself up over, I mean, a lot of times if you actually track down maybe the person who you think you did something to or whatever, and you call them up and said, oh, you know, I want to apologize for whatever, they'd be like, who are you? Well, you oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. What are you talking about? And this is a little weird. And uh, I'd totally forgotten about that. Uh, and so, right. I mean, we, we, so it's like, we've, we've built up this whole thing that doesn't really exist. I mean, it doesn't forgive whatever it was you did in the first sure, place. Sure, sure. But the compassion to move on and the realization that it's in the past and gone. And perfect people or pe people who try to, you know, uh, portray their perfect one. Mm, how many of us really believe that too? It's pretty boring and um, they're not relatable. You know, I don't know about mm -hmm. you, but the friends that I have that are the closest, 
we all have a little bit of dirty laundry and <laughs> that's what makes us real. And yeah. I can't sit on the couch and talk with someone who acts like they're perfect. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have that much to talk about. So, um, or, you know, the person on the beach walking down, who's just, you know, proud of, of their body and they're just real versus the one sucking it in, acting perfect. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just not real. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And I just, and I really, I just really wanted to underline that point about, you know, change changing changing the habits and or changing how you you think about things because the other thing just struck me was we hang on to every little criticism or perceived criticism sometimes it's not even criticism it's just perceived criticism but we don't take we don't hang on to compliments or when people point out good things we do whatever we tend to sort of oh, brush them aside mm -hmm. and we focus on all the other and it just when you were talking earlier, it just struck me as that's that would be a great place to start flipping it. Yes, yes, that's that's goes back to that making making praise familiar, yeah. because mm -hmm. if that's another thing is we often you're right we push it away and when we want when you want to to see big improvement in your life is make praise familiar and criticism unfamiliar, so let it in allow it say thank you. And don't say, oh, this, you know, this shirt I got at, you know, Target. Oh, thank you. You know, this is, I appreciate that. Um, make praise familiar. Make loving yourself familiar. I mean, the relationship you have with yourself is the longest relationship you will ever be in. Yet it's not the one that we nurture the most. So mm -hmm. make praise and loving yourself familiar and criticism and self-critique unfamiliar. Yeah, I love it. Um, listen, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Christina's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. So I am a rapid transformational therapist, which is a method of hypnotherapy and an empowerment coach and a Reiki healer. And um, I'm at wisewoods.com. And I love working with women and with self-doubt and self-esteem issues just to crush, crush all that and become unstoppable. Yeah, listen, fantastic. Listen, thank you very much for today. Thank you all for watching and listening. And we will see you for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.